start. So as everybody is trickling in, I uh, my name is Liza Piqueo. I'm with the US Forest Service International Programs, also one of the coordinators of the Beyond Trees Network that's hosting this webinar today. And I'd like to just offer a couple of ideas for housekeeping. Please, in the chat, if you could just put your name and your organization, that'd be really uh, welcome. And if you could also, um, if it's not muted yet, mute your um, microphones to allow for better sound. This video, is, I mean, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Beyond Trees Network YouTube channel. It's being live streamed right now on Facebook. I will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions for Amir, let us know and um, we will be happy to take them and have Amir answer. So it is 10.05. I'm going to turn this over for my dear friend and colleague, Amir Dilich from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, this is such a pleasure and um, to have him here and for him to talk about this intersection, as you can see on his shirt of urban wildlife, particularly bears, wolves, and lynxes with um, the nearest city of Biatch. And he'll talk more about that as he describes his work at Una National Park um, in Northwest Bosnia and Herzegovina. So welcome, Amir, I'll let you start. And then um, uh, I'll turn off my video and good luck. Thank you, Eliza, for the introduction. So hi, everyone. Nice to have you all here. So I'm going to be talking a little bit today about the large carnivores, as you can see here on my shirt, the bears, wolves, and lixins in the Bosnia and Herzegovina. But you, you can't consider it for the whole Balkan territory. It's pretty much the same. I'm going to show you how do we work, how do we manage conservation projects all around Bosnia and Herzegovina and the National Park. So, just a second, sorry. So here is where the Bosnia is located in the Europe, in the region of Balkans, one small and complex country, but really rich in biodiversity, as I will gonna show you right in a moment. So a few, a few lines about the UNA National Park. One of the four national parks in Bosnia was declared a national park back in 2008. Approximately really to, uh, 23,000 hectares of which almost 14,000 are under forests. And in the regime of direct developments about 6,000. Some of the main characteristics, the most important ones about Duna National Park will position on the border of the three climatic areas, karst forms, hydrography, which are unique in this part of Europe, and relief forms that created one of the rare natural roads to the Adriatic Sea, and huge mosaic of habitats with a lot of relics and endemic animal and plant species can be found in Duna National Park. This is our first bear that I will be talking soon. So first one landed uh, how River Una got its name. Well, it says that the ancient Roman who lost their sense of duty through many conquests came to the banks of the Una River and were amazed by the beauty of the emerald green river. And one of these Roman sh soldiers shouted Una which on Italian language means the only one. And that's the, the reason how the river got the name that has that is has kept to this day. And where are you gonna find your next location? You can just find it in Una National Park because we have these three beautiful rivers, Una, Una Tsenkirka, one of the three jewels of Una National Park. This is the spring of life. You can call it the spring of life in one national park in Balkans. It springs in Croatia. It's one of the most beautiful springs that I have ever seen. It's around 200 meters deep. It's really, really amazing. Really wisdom of nature. So this is another jewel of Una National Park. The 
Strebetsky Buch waterfall. It's almost 25 meters tall waterfall located in the heart of Una National Park. And the one of the main attraction of Una National Park and the largest complex of waterfalls is located in the second attraction of Una National Park. Those are the, these waterfalls called Martin Broads. And there is another legend about those waterfalls. As you can see here in this illustration, the girl with blonde hair called Marta fell in love with this curly haired guy. She, one day she wanted to cross the river Una to go to see her beloved because the, her parents didn't want to hear her that love. And while she was trying to cross the river, she, she fell in the water because these rocks are called the Una Tufa. They're really slippery. She fell, she drowned. And that was that unfortunate love of two young people. And in memory of the girl Marta, this place in Uno National Park got the name Marta's Broad. Okay, so now let's dive into the large carnivores. What do we do here? First, what are the large carnivores? We call them apex predator because they're on the top of the food pyramids. They mostly attack animals that are easier to catch because they don't want to waste energy uh, hunting. They, they catch mostly old, weaker or unhealthy animals and thus they're influencing the natural act selection and which is really important for biodiversity. And we also call them the umbrella species because they contribute to the preservation of other species and the habitat in which they live. And they're really, really important. And as you can see, they really need a large areas to thrive, to breed, to hunt. And because of that, throughout the history, there was always a conflict with humans and the large carnivores, especially the wolves and the bears, because the both species they fought for the territory and for the prey species. The humans used to hunt deers and the wolves and the bears used to hunt deers. And so there was always struggling between the territories and the prey species. And the large carnivores are also threatened by habitat loss, fragmentation, traffic, poaching, lack, lack of prey, etc. So here in Bosnia Herzegovina, in Balkans, and in Nuna National Park, we have three species of large carnivores, the brown bear, the Eurasian lynx, and the gray wolf. And in the European continent, in addition to these three species, we have two more. We have the wolverine and we have the Iberian lynx, lynx partinus. And the Eurasian lynx is the, is the largest cat, cat in Europe. So we have in Bosnia-Herzegovina, the wolves that are part of the Dinaric Balkan population, the bear Dinaric Pinda population in Greece, and lynx of the Dinaric population. And in the last decades, the great efforts through many projects, through many NGOs, have been put into their conservation in order to maintain their large and continuous populations in order to preserve the biodiversity and the coexistence with humans. So what's one of the biggest issues for the Bosnia Herzegovina? It's the Convention on International Trades in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. That is international agreement between governments. It's aimed to ensure the, that international trade in specimens of wild animals and plants does not threaten the survival of those species in the wild. And Bosnia Herzegovina joined that convention back in 2009, but what's, what is the problem? We did not ratify this agreement, which opened the door to smuggling of hunting trophies. That's really, really, really bad for the wildlife. And according, according to Interpol estimations, global illegal wildlife trade is between like 159 billion like US dollars. And th this ranks the illegal trade in wild animals and plants second in terms of value just behind the drug trades. So you can see what this brings to the wildlife, what issues it, it accumulates. 
just let me make this story story So the Bosnia Herzegovina is characterized by, by an extremely large number of hunting associations with many hunting alliances and excessive membership. And as you can see in this illustration that I made and practically no control of their activities, which inevitably leads to poaching and distribution because we did not ratify the convention of live animals or after shooting their parts, both in the country and outside the country. So that's really a big problem because people, people really have no, have no clues on how big damage they are doing with those activities. Another big issue is the management plans. We do not, we do not have still management plans in Bosnia and Herzegovina because we're a really complex country one country run by three presidents and one country formed of three entities. So what is, what is absurd here? You see the bear here in the photo and in one entity of Bosnia-Herzegovina called Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is approximately half of the country, the bear is protected by law. It, it must not be hunted while in the other territory of the Bosnia, other parts of the whole country, like 49% of the country, Republic of Srpska, the bear is allowed to be hunted. And from October 1st to May 15, and it cost up to 4,000 US dollars. So you can see what do we, how big problems do we have? So what do we do in all national parks so far? We, because we were the first to start researching the large carnivores in the Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the goal of all previous projects and continuous activities that we have been carrying out since uh, 2012 is the establishment of mechanism for long-term activities that will ensure the protection of population, monitoring inventory of large carnivores in the national park in Bosnia and Herzegovina as well as a way of harmonious coexistence with people. And while one of the mechanism, one of the important goals that we wanted to achieve and still are achieving is to transfer such mechanism, methods, knowledge, and experience to other areas, to other countries, to other NGOs, to students, to future individuals that would help us protect these species of large carnivores. So at the beginnings, we started, as I said, almost 11 years ago. And in that time, no one ever succeeded in catching a live bear, releasing that bear unharmed, putting a GPS collar with transmitters, and then monitoring that bear for a period one to two years while he's wearing that GPS collar. So we were the pioneers back then in a large carnivore management, but so far we did an awesome job and we are still doing it in order to preserve these amazing animals. So this is the first bear that we caught back then in 2012 for like the alarm went off around 10 p.m. And the result of that alarm was gathering of all experts from Croatia, from Bosnia and Herzegovina and project partners who were ready by 5 a.m. in the morning at the location in Ula National Park to put a collar on our first king of the forest is called the Bear Yutoc by the neighboring mountain in Ula National Park. So this is how it looked. This is the, the dart from the injection, injection gun that we're gonna be talking soon. And this is the pattern from the GPS transmitters from the collar. The bear usually wears the collar for at least one or two years after the collar via the drop off effect felts from the bear's neck. And then we, through that year or two, we get these patterns where the bear was hibernating, danning, breathing, movements, etc. So how, why do we catch bears, lynxes, wolves? Why do we do that? So in order to gain life insight into the life of wild animals, the bear especially, because we caught five of them in colors so far, the size and use of the area they live, distances they travel, activity during 
different times of the day, seasons, social structure, breeding, denning. We capture wild animals and we mark them with transmitters. So here you can see the biggest one with the red paper is the collar for the bear. The middle one is the collar for the wolf. And the third one, the smallest one is for the lynx because lynx is the smallest of the three large carnivores. This is the tranquilizing gun, the air gun. Uh, and these are the two drugs. When we mix these drugs, we get uh, one strong drug that we use to sedate a bear from this, from this tranquilizing gun. And we do that uh, from our car. You're gonna see that later. So what is this? This is the bear cub. It was six months old when it got killed. He was, he got hit by a car close to Duna National Park while he was trying to cross the streets to go on the other part of the territory. And we use this body to, to practice, to learn how to, how to fill up these protocols for a bear. So in how to measure the bear proper, properly, how to, how to extract tissues for genetic analysis, how to determine the age of a bear by the two teeth extraction. So when you process the bear, you have to measure approximately everything. Here on the paper, you can see, but I have on the next slides better. So how do we catch a brown bear? I'm gonna try to tell you in a few simple steps. First, it, imp it implies commitment, field work, several days of absence, no matter what you do. If, you, if the traps are active, is, is, if the project is on, no matter where you are, if you are on some conference, if you're sleeping, if you're on some kind of a dinner, if the alarm sounds, you have to get in your car, you have to go to the field and you have to to check if the animal is really in the trap because we really don't want for animal to be too long in the trap to suffer because an animal is the caught, especially the bear, he gets really angry and we don't want for a bear to be in a stressful position for too long. We want to, to do our stuff as soon as possible to, to finish everything. So we use these wildlife cameras that are equipped with motion sensor, with infrared sensors. So everything that passes by the camera, camera will record. And it really helps us in the field research to gain a lot of scientific data about the prey species, about the apex predators, about everything. So first, when we want to catch a bear, we, we have to lure the bear on some specific area. It's not really good to feed the bear to to build like these, the bear restaurants when the bear knows where he can find the food. It's really not good. And, but when we are doing some, these kind of projects, we really have to do this in order to know where to set up the trap because bears, they thrive on huge territories in the forest. In one day, bear can, can walk up to 20 miles in one day. It's really huge territory. And with this, we do this approximately a month for two months, three months, rooting the bear. And then we set up this trap. So I'm gonna, in the next slide, show you how it's done. So this is what we do. If we, if we have a livestock that is, that died on some occasion, we use this, as a bait also, we use the corn and you only have to wear to, to bring with yourself a bear spray for the protection. And this is one of the presents, how to recognize the presence of a bear, a huge paw print. So this is the first step. I have to tell you, this is really, these are the humane traps. It really does not hurt the animal in any way, ex except it causes a little bit of stress when the animal steps in but no harm, no physical pain, et cetera. So the first step you have to dig up a hole that's a little bit wider than the bare feet. You put these twigs in order to minimize the pressure. So when the bear steps in the hole, do not immediately fall down or he will just put his leg and he will run away. So slowly to 
puncture the twigs and so and when that happens he will step in this steel cable and the other part of this steel cable goes around the tree and the bear is caught when he tries to remove his leg the steel cable will go around his wrinkle and he will be caught and this is the fourth picture when when it's written trap here the yellow sign this is the fully prepared trap so you will you really wouldn't say that it's really well camouflaged okay when the bear is caught we get with our we use our land rovers land rovers really good for the field we use tranquilizing gun and we sedate the bear after we sedate the bear we do all of our stuff we take blood sample we we to take out the teeth for the genetic analysis to determine the 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 age of the bear and we measure the bear and all kind of stuff and use the tissue sample for post analysis this is the bear when he was sedated he's sleeping this is the bear when after he woke up from anesthesia. We put the GPS collar around his neck and he's ready. As soon as he feels better, he's ready to walk away. These are some patterns that you have to fill up when you catch a bear. This is the blood picture of a bear. So like the humans, pretty much similar. This is tissue append of tube with uh, tissue and alcohol to preserve it this is the protocol for bear dance yes we also do bear tanning you're gonna see and this is me like collect collecting dna samples from the bear feces like many of my friends like told me emir why are you wasting all of your scientific potential on collecting like a bear shit like i have to do this to extract the dna from the pieces because we get a lot of very little data from this and it's really significant you really have to do this and it's really fun either way so this is me in the bear dance so the bear spends the winter so the bear hibernates inside the den dens are most often cracks holes small caves in rocks the bear adapts it needs by digging it can also dig a hole underneath the tree roots, but not that often. And the, these dens are really in quite inaccessible places to make sure that no one will disturb them because in the breeding seasons, bears really need peace for, because the bear is only mammal to, to give birth to the bear cubs during the January when the winter is really harsh. And those little bear cubs are only like 300 grams in weight, they're blind, and they're, they are hairless. So it's really important not to disturb the bears during that period, or all the bear cubs will gonna suffer and will die. So when we enter the bear den, here is me inside the bear den, it's really important for the science to know the den shape, the size, accessibility to the den, surroundings, orientation, is it east, is it west? What what did Bear use to make his bed? Because when you enter this den, it's really the entrance is really narrow, it's really small. But as you can see, when I go inside the den, it's really huge, spacious, and I have to I have to determine of which material did Bear use to make a den. What leaves did he use? What 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 is underneath the leaves? Is it dirt? Something else? So it's really we have to find the, if you're wondering, the bear really has a place when he, where he is pooping. He has a place where he's sleeping inside the den. So it's really interesting. So this is me uh, checking around the terrain, checking the traps. This is our hunting lodge. And this is our dog. He's really good at sniffing the bears, trails, tracks. And when we do that, we are waiting safe in this hunting lodge with our dog and without the dog you really can't find a bear because when we want to use this lodge without the traps when we want to sedate the bear from the hunting lodge when you shot the bear it has like 10 minutes before the drug starts working and in that 10 minutes bear can really can run really really much 
distances and without the dog you cannot find the bear so this is the last bear that we caught last year the ranger he says like i'm the ranger around these transboundary forests please show respect when walking around so let's now dive into the threats coexistence of humans and people in both sides of the balkans what threatens the brown bear that's really the habitat fragmentation and degradation we know uh, of the agriculture expansion people do a lot of deforestation in order to to make food in order to plant agriculture uh, agricultural plants in order to produce food for so many people on planet earth and that's one of the problem for the bears because they have to migrate they have to find another source of food they have to find another place to hibernate and they often go to the human settlements because the bears are opportunists, even though they're omnivores, they are always they are always going for an easier way of food. And because the people going are going even more deeper into the bears' territory, the bears often get in conflict with humans, especially attacking sheep, goats, and beehives in search for larvae, larves and uh, bees. So mortality the bear in traffic. This is the bear from the first slides that I showed you. He was he got hit by a car, especially because we don't have these wildlife crossings around the Balkans. Re really few we have them. I know for some in Croatia, and they're really necessary necessary for the bears to go or any other large carnivores to cross on the other side of its territory. Because if we don't have these wildlife crossings, the bears easily get hit by a car. And it's really, really a lot of damage. What else? Poor acceptance by humans. The, the acceptance by humans is key to long-term survival. And the most common cause of conflict between humans and bears is food from anthropogenic sources, especially the garbage cans. It's really necessary to pay attention to where, in what ways, and what way waste is disposed of? Because you know, for the rule, the fed bear is the dead bear. And we have to protect and prevent bears from getting used to such sources of food. Also, poaching, really, as you could see in previous slides, without the legislatives in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have a lot of poaching for the bear skin, bear trophies. And a lot of in, in a lot of restaurants in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you can see the bear trophies on the wall. So it's really, really one of the issues. And also the climate change. Climate change threatens all of the large carnivores, especially the bears, because of these wildfires. When you have what because of irresponsible people during the spring times, people love to set agricultural fields on fire to get rid of the weeds. Uh, and many times that fire can get out of control and it can get into the forests and many animals suffer, the rabbits, the prey species and the apex predators. And when the bears lose their habitats, they always have to find another source of foods. And they often go to human settlements in search of foods. And especially that happens if the bear has not been generously covered with a layer of fat since autumn, it's really difficult for the bear to wait for the spring. And especially if it has uh, cubs, in that case, the cubs will die and the bear will have to find another source of food. And that is mostly in the human settlements. And humans and bears are direct competitors for space and the prey species since the beginning of the world. And when the men started hunting like thousands of years ago. Uh, and that competition is really determined by the availability and of resources and adaptability, uh, adaptability of each of those two species. Man is certainly more adaptable and efficient in use of resources compared to the bear. And man is constantly de developing new methods, techniques, and strategies to use resources, while the bear only uses resources 
in natural way. That is the big difference. And this leads us to the conclusion that the competition between humans and bears today is absolutely unequal and that the systematic protection of nature and species is necessary. We must learn to share the habitat with large carnivores in order to preserve those species. So the, about grave wolf, the wolf, as you know, is very distrustful and cautious animal. It's really hard to check the wolf. He runs through the forest and even when our wildlife camera records the wolf, the shots are usually blurry and because the wolf is contained the motion, but it's really rare to get those clean shots. But even though if we do not get the clean shots, if the shots are blurry, we really appreciate that. And it sometimes can be really enough for us. This is the sign in Una National Park, like the wolf on the road. How to recognize the presence of a wolf? The paw print, it's really similar to dog. It can be a little, it, it usually it is bigger, but we have also large dog, dog breeds. And sometimes it's really hard to, to make a difference between those prints. And also the wolf feces. This is the typical wolf feces. It's a, it's a full of hair because this wolf was feeding on the on the hog, on the wild boars. So it's really, it's really full of the boars hairs. And when the when the wolf eats bone, the feces will be really white, like a snow. And also you see a lot, this is the wolf urine. The wolf urinates around the snow marking the territory. And this is the drug that we use to tranquilize, to sedate the wolf. And this is the wolf pee that we use to lure the wolf from another pack to the territory where the tribes are. Because when we put the wolf pee, the, wolf, the pack of wolf immediately thinks, oh, okay, there is another pack of the wolves here, let's check it out. And usually they can step on the trap, but they're really cautious and it's really hard to catch them. And we use the blow gun like the, we blow this dart on the wolf leg and we sedate him. These are some, this is the kangaroo jerky, like the bait. We try this bait for the wolf. This is the wolf trap. So it really does not hurt the wolf. These sides are made of rubber, of hard rubber. And I really tried to put my arm my fist inside this trap, it really, it hurts, but it really can't hurt an animal in any way. It's really, it's really humane. And this is the whole baker. It's really, it's made for all of the large carnivores to lure them some specific era. It really has this pinguine smell and it really attracts so much of carnivores, foxes, wolves, dogs, every, everything. This is the protocol for measurements, how to measure a wolf, how to measure, how to determine the age of the wolves according to the teeth. So pretty much similar with the bears and with the lynxes. Here, if you can see, this is the prepared trap for a wolf. This is the, the beech tree and this is the fish and the trap is here in the middle. So wolf has to start sniffing around here. So if, the, if this fish was anywhere, any, anywhere closer to the trap, the wolf could get it like this. He would just have to put his head a little bit in front and take the fish. So fish has to be a little bit distanced from the trap. So the wolf will step first here, then he'll try a little bit more, and then he will step here in the middle and he will get caught. This is that we use this gun to sedate bears and for the wolf use this like the blow gun i don't know exact name i guess it's a blow gun with these darts and what that threatens the gray wolf the first one is intolerance and man's fear of the wolf the main threat to wolf in bosnia herzegovina and europe is considered to be the low level of general acceptance because the wolf sometimes attack domestic animals if they are in the weaker condition or not protected at all. And for the owners of the domestic animals, it's both financial and emotional problem, which often leads to requests to increase hunting quotas for culling. And this is the cattle 
the damage in Una National Park, the wolves did, but they're, that is their, just what they do. We have to accept that and we have to protect our livestock better. We're gonna get to that later. So pre-justice, fear and means understanding of the species also contribute to not accepting the wolf. As you know, the many fairy tales from the young age, we are learning our kids that the wolves are bad, that they are really like scary, fearsome animals that we should avoid. And that's, and that the wolf is an evil and dangerous creature. And some hunters believe that the wolf threatens hunting opportunities. So hunters also love to, to hunt, let's say the deer and wolves hunt only to survive. And that's one of the reasons why hunters, the, they do not prefer the wolf because of the fight for the same prey. And the wolf is also an opportunist animal as a bear, similar. And by selecting, he's always selecting weaker and sick animals because he don't want to chase animals uh, so much in order to waste energy. He'll, he's always looking for weaker, sick animals. And in that way, the wolf helped preserve the vitality of the population and strength of the ecosystem. It also habitat fragmentation, loss of the prey, similar for the for the for the as the bears. Wolves have the same problem because the wolf needs enough natural prey to survive. Every day, wolf needs about three to five kilograms of meat to survive and decreasing the number of roe deer, red deer, which are the main wolf prey can lead to more wolf attacks on domestic animals. So it's really, really important to pay attention to the prey species. So let's talk something about Eurasian lynx. This is our first lynx that we colored and still are monitoring in April last year is the first we made like history in Bosnia and Govina because we were the first to capture these lynx, which is the most endangered species of large carnivores in Bosnia and Govina in Europe. And you will see why. So a lynx, it's really like shadow hunter, really live mysterious life, life. And it hunts prey up to four times its own size. And in Bosnia and Govina, which is a real complex country, with many issues, he's permanently protected, but it poached for trophies. And even today, stuffed specimens can be found in certain public spaces. And in the minds of people in Bosnia and Herzegovina who are mostly ignorant, the lynx is perceived as a beast which attacks sheep, goats, and chickens. So according to some claims, the last individual in Bosnia and Herzegovina was shot down back like more than 100 years ago and also happened in Europe, which would be like more developed countries than, than Balkan countries. And the extermination of the lynx from the area of, of Western and Central Europe took place before its extermination in some areas of the Balkan Peninsula, because here in Balkans, we are living mostly by traditional way of life and not the way of life as developed European countries used to live. And they exterminated even the bears and even the lynxes. And now those developed European countries are teaching us now how to preserve our wildlife, our large carnivores, teaching us the way, but they firstly exterminated their bears. In Switzerland, you have one bear left like they wiped them all out. And now they are teaching us how to preserve all our own large carnivores. So what happens? The reintroduction happens. The Life Links project in Europe is still on. And the first reintroduction was carried out with three pairs originating from Slovakian Carpathians. So three males, three females were introduced and during like the 50 or 60 years by now, all of the offsprings of the lynxes were from those three pairs of parents and a lot of problems occurred. So the young cats, kittens, they didn't live too long. They started to die 
at young age. So it's a lot of problems with genetics because of the inbreeding. That's one of the problem. And also the poaching of the lynx, as I told you, because in Boston, this is species protected by law, though it's more population. Regular hunting of lynx is not allowed. And the lynx is now classified strictly protected species in Boston Herzegovina. And this is from the this is the photos from the April. As you can see, we are now measuring the temperature inside the temperature of the lynx while he's sedated, sedated, while we took all the all of the clinical procedures on him. So it, he's real the fur is really, really gentle, really amazing cats, one of my favorites of large carnivores, especially because he's living mysterious life. And really beautiful animal and here is me this lynx was a male around 23 kilograms you see these huge front paws they're really much bigger than the than the back ones and this is that same lynx he was filmed this the white this white border this is croatia uh and this is Bosnia and Herzegovina in Croatia. And the links you see where he was filmed. He was filmed in Croatia because these are the border, border territories. We caught him right on the border with Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia. And we are still monitoring these links. So what's another important lore of large carnivores like this bear, they're omnivores bear is omnivores and through the bear digestive cycle he contributes to the spread of seeds of plants especially the nobile forest trees as the cherry and improve the vegetation structure and diversity of the ecosystem one of the roles just of the bears and the wolves especially they are scavengers because the wolves, they're always trying to hunt weakened, sick animals. And also that is their sanitary role in the ecosystem. And how can large carnivores, what do you think contribute to the local communities? How can we learn to coexist with large carnivores? And one of the most important benefits is the economic stimulants that large carnivores can represent for a community. And as you can see in those illustrations, they make a natural area even more attractive to tourists. You have a photo tourism. You can go with uh, rangers waiting on a hunting lounge and taking photos of large carnivores. One aspect of tourism. Uh, there is also like the presence of large carnivores can also be realized by special labeling on these local agricultural products which will then attract new visitors, new tourists, new explorers, et cetera. And it will give a positive impact on the green tourism of the area. So in or, as I told, in order to preserve these species, we have to learn to share the habitat with them. If the food is available, and unprotected, they may try to get it, and thus they can harm humans. The bears, they can damage crops, break beehives in search of larves and honey. They can attack livestock, sheep, dogs. And if surprised or feel threatened, bears can even attack humans. But I have to tell you the bears, they're really frightened animals. They're really, have a huge fear of humans because the bears long ago figured out that humans, they have a gun and that humans can shot, shot on distance. And only the cautious bear survived and only the, the bears that taught the, their cubs to, to stay away from human, they survived. And that is the reason why the bears are really scared of people. But if we are leaving the food unprotected, if we do not use these bear-proof garbage containers, then the bears can lose their fear of humans and it may not run when they see 
human and may attack the human. So it's really important to use this to educate population, especially youths in the, from the elementary and high school, even the students, and really, really important to protect the livestock with these electrical fences and to use adequate sheepdogs. And these electrical fences, once when the bear gets striked with uh, electricity, but really, really proper way, he will never try to get close to that area again. But most often people here in Bosnia, they're, they're trying to save, I don't know what, and they're always like putting a uh, small, uh, like two or three wires that are not strong enough, that are not powered enough with electricity and the bears just gets a little bit stunned. And after a few tries, he breaks into the, into the area and start demolishing the beehives in order to find the food. And that's pretty much it. My message, my last message for this presentation is that nature knows no boundaries, only people, and we have to find a harmonious, harmonious way, way to coexist with large carnivores because they're the large carnivores are, are treasure of every country, especially here in Europe, in the Balkans. They are the species that we have to preserve for future generations. And it's really, really amazing to be doing on these con conservation projects around wildlife. Okay, I'm, all the questions are welcomed. I'm gonna now pass to Liza and thank you for listening to me. Um, thank you so much, Amir. And wow, um, you have, I think, pretty much inspired so many people first to go to Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's absolutely stunning where you live. Um, and this information, the webinar um, that you've put together is so informative and so uh, holistic. And I learned a lot today. And I wanna invite folks to, uh, if you are comfortable, turn on your video and join us and ask your questions. I know that uh, we had a couple of comments in the, mm -hmm. um, and questions in the chat. So we have from Bangladesh, from uh, Rajasri Nandi, that she says that local community awareness is indeed also important for preservations. And Phil Rodbell, who is with Urban Research here at the Forest Service, um, has been putting in the chat several links to articles around urban mm -hmm. and wildlife. And so um, he says, yes, harmonious coexistence is so important. Um, Julie uh, asks, is anyone there using GIS tools to track, report, and or analyze locations and movement of these animals? Yeah, that's one of the issues in Una National Park. As we're, right, we still didn't have the GIS system involved in our research, but since this year we are we started to to do GIS. We are still at the beginning, but I'm currently at the moment, I'm going through the training for GIS mapping. And I hope I'm gonna use all of, of my knowledge so far and the knowledge I get through that training for GIS to make a whole database in the National Park for GIS. Because for I, I'm aware that GIS is really, important for science now and it can really 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 get you far far away on another levels in the way of researching anything regard regard regarding to biodiversity wildlife plants forest communities it's really important to have that all mapped and saved in database in the but since it was really expensive before uh, to develop that database for GIS in Una National Park. We didn't have funds as we are pretty much new national park and we live in this 
situation in Bosnia Herzegovina, this real complex country, but we are now trying through the projects. Like last year, I was I was writing one type of a project to to implement the GIS training on the staff uh, in a national park, and we have we got to another project uh, training that started like this month. So I hope I, I'm gonna learn a lot about GIS and I forgot I forgot just to mention if you have any questions, you can I'm gonna type my email in the chat and you can uh, send me anything that you want. You can also add, add me on LinkedIn. We can even chat there about future collaboration, about future projects, about anything that we can co collaborate together anyway so i'm open to all kind of opportunities and meeting new friends learning new stuff learning about wildlife in other countries where the u.s forest service international programs are operating so i'm really really looking forward to any new chance to learn anything that is connected with biodiversity around the world that was wonderful thank you amir and i think you have um, Shahadeb had asked a question earlier on uh, urban wildlife conflict, and I think Shahadeb maybe during the, at the presentation has answered some of those questions mm -hmm. for you. Um, and I know he is also wondering when is the best time to go out to Bosnia and Herzegovina? The best time to go to visit the National Park, I would say, is the springtime. When the vegetation is starting to wake up and everything is starting to get green, especially around the waterfalls in the national park, as I, as I told, like the Una, it's really with his with its emerald green water color. It's really one of the most beautiful rivers in the national in the national park and in this part of European Balkans. And Bosnia Herzegovina as a country is in the first place in Balkans. Uh, when we talk about the uh, clean water and in the top 10 in Europe. So we're real, we're rich in water and biodiversity and wildlife. So you cannot, I can say, I can tell you that you cannot mistake if you come in any time of a year, but I will recommend like the springtime, especially if you want to visit, but it's a must have to visit the waterfalls and the mountains around the city of Bihać where I live. And it's really untouched nature, as I told you, like the people of Balkans used to live on traditional way of life, uh, not like developed way of life like Western European countries who exterminate their large carnivores, we preserved our large carnivores, we preserved our nature. So really have, even during the last ice age, our forests didn't, suffered that much like the forest and the plants and the wildlife in the northern and western part of Europe. So really preserved a huge potential by diversity potential around these areas. So you really have you, you would really enjoy especially we have rafting on River Runa. You have like huge rubber boats and you go around down the River Runa, down the waterfalls. It's really it can last up to three to four days to see everything from the boat. So it's really, really unique aspects of nature. Lovely, thank you, Emir. And um, we do have a question as we wrap up here um, about deer hunting. What are your thoughts on that? Um, and is mm -hmm. it necessary? Do you think it should be banned or is it necessary? No, it's, it shouldn't be banned, it's necessary, but you have to do it on proper way. You have to follow the, the hunting legislatives and the law in order to maintain the exact number of, let's say, deer specimens in one habitat. You know, we don't want for a deer to reproduce much because if the deer, roe deer, rabbits, they reproduce much in some area, uh, there will be a huge problem with on vegetation because the ears they like to feed on the tree buds. And <laughs> when they do that, the trees suffer. The tree cannot 
reproduce enough, the forest cannot reproduce, that's one of the problem. So we have to have certain numbers of umbrella of the, or the apex predators to control the number of deer species. And also in some countries, in even Bosnia and Herzegovina, you have a, a lot of hunters because the hunt, like 10 years ago, it was, it was done just to satisfy the human hunger, human used to hunt just for food. Now the hunting became the sport. Mm -hmm. In many countries, people just do it for fun. They're just hunting. But in many countries you have, like every year you have a certain number of species that you can hunt down. Let's say you can hunt three bears in one year. You can hunt, I don't know, 50 roe deers in one year. It depends. But you have to just to measure the potential of every hunting uh, every hunting part in the forests, like community, how much specimen of certain wildlife you can hunt in those area. So it's important to maintain a certain number of, of any species in the forests. We don't want to, for any species to reproduce so much. If you have too many bears, they will start to going often to the human settlements. Mm -hmm. If you have too many deers, they're gonna destroy all the ceilings in forests. So everything has to be in the balance. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Amir. And um, we will entertain Kelsey's question, but I know that it, we are at the top of the hour. So before we cut, mm -hmm. um, Kelsey, if you have, if you could stay just a little bit longer. Uh, Amir will answer your question, which is in the chat, but I've also placed in the chat some items for everyone as you move on to your day or to your evening. You, Amir does have a very short interview that we did with him. Uh, it's on our Beyond Trees Network YouTube channel. And then just some things that are coming up are these items. And next week, February 17th, if you guys are interested in presenting your research paper, at the World Forum in Urban Forest in October. The call for abstracts deadline is February 17th. So get those in. And then if you want uh, an opportunity for a longer um, event for 90 minutes, uh, the call for site event proposals due April 28th, it's all on the World Forum and Urban Forest website. And that is hosted by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and partners, including the Forest Service, Arbor Day Foundation, International Society for Arbor Culture, and a whole bunch of others. Um, we are going to celebrate UN World Wildlife Day on March 3rd, so stay tuned for that. And then this year, there's a big emphasis, as it should be, on human health. So stay tuned for invitations to some exciting panel discussions, some exciting webinars, as well as the road to the world form and urban forest will be paved with events that have a lot to do with human health, with equity and inclusion, and with resiliency. With that, if you can stay longer and talk to Amir, that's wonderful. I will entertain now and get back to Kelsey and your um, question. So Amir, Kelsey um, is asking about how do you account for uh, the huge movement of large animals and large mammals in particular going in and out of UNA and who do you partner with? Well, uh, we use those, as you could see in my slides, wildlife cameras. They're really important for field work in any scientific research project. So without the wildlife cameras that are equipped with a motion sensor, with infrared sensors, so every movement that every animal that passes by the camera, it will be recorded. You can set that camera on the video modes, photo mode, and you just put the batteries, you find the perfect place in the forest, let's say, because the, the wildlife usually wants, usually get, roams around the forest on some old forest roads. Mm. So no one wants to spend so much energy going around the bush, bushes going around some 
and some area that is really not really good for walking for roaming. So everyone want clean and nice pet for walking. Like humans, same way as animals. They don't, they don't want to spend that much energy, energy. So when we see some potential really good place to place wildlife camera, we place that camera around the tree and then we leave it for a month or two and the camera starts sending data and photographs whatever it records and without those cameras we really we really can do much because because with those cameras you can track the prey species you can track the apex predators so if you have in if you have in a forest enough prey species you can be sure that you will have a wolf a bear a lynx around those forests if you don't have the prey species you really can't be sure that in, the, in your habitat, it's going to be present an apex predator because he really needs a prey to hunt. So everything in nature is connected. Ecosystem is really one perfect creation. I would say, I don't know, I would say perfect God's creation. It's because it's really amazing how it works. So everything is connected from the smallest animal, from the smallest insect, from the smallest mushroom to the biggest brown bear. So with those wildlife cameras, we do that. And we partner with, mostly we do projects with World Wildlife Fund, WWF. They really operate through many countries in the world. We mostly do with NGOs, let's say in Slovenia. They really do great work. We partner up, let's say with, uh, in Germany with uh, Euronatur. It's really a strong NGO that, most of work on large carnivores. And we also partner with like NGOs from Austria, from those Western and Northern European countries, Switzerland also. As I told in the webinar, like long time ago, they wiped down, exterminated all of their bears, wolves in a fight for the land, for the habitats. And the Balkan people, because of our traditional way of life, not that advanced before as they were, we succeeded in preservation of those species. And now we are, because, because they're, they're now much richer than the Balkan countries, they're now putting through their NGOs, a lot of funds, a lot of open calls for project proposals to finance the Balkan countries and Balkan NGOs, Balkan companies to, to work on the large carnivores management and conservation so right. that Europe could be rich in biodiversity for Europe to not, to not lose their population of those valuable species. Perfect. Well, that's great. Well, thanks so much for the presentation. I did just want to introduce myself and maybe you saw some of my colleagues, Boislav Todorov and Laura Peterson. We're all working in Eastern Europe with the U.S. Forest Service. So it's really delightful that you're in this series and that you've been working with Liza. So thanks so much. And I think nice a picture meet. of the Una from last summer uh, swimming out oh. the river. So Hi. nice to see you. <laughs> Wonderful. Wow, you, Kelsey, that's, nice that's amazing. Um, thank you.